currently in place and to contain that these policies remain appropriate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, the Public Safety Minister has the ability and the authority to reverse this decision and put policies in place to ensure that this never happens right, again. Right. Now, Mr. Speaker, children are present at these healing lodges because the healing lodges are meant for offenders who are actually being reintegrated back into our society. Tori Stafford's killer is not even eligible for parole until 2031. She's not being reintegrated back into society. Now, I know the Liberals are stuck on their talking points defending killers, but Mr. Speaker, will they stand up for the rights of victims and for justice and do something to put this individual back behind bars? Yeah. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, Section 28 of the Corrections Act says that inmate placement decisions must be made by correction services. That act was created in 1992 by a Conservative government, and Section 28 was last updated by the Harper government. As much as he might like to, the Minister of Public Safety cannot simply overrule laws, including those created by a Conservative government. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, opposition House Leader. Well, Mr. Order. Speaker, that's weak and that's ineffective because there are actually precedents from our Conservative government where the Minister of Public Safety reversed decisions. But the difference right. is it was Conservatives who stand up for victims, Correct. not hug a thug Liberals for eyes defending the rights of criminals. Now, Mr. Speaker, the Liberal summer of failure, most Canadians are worse off after it. But you know what? There are a few winners. Terrorist Omar Kadar living large on an additional $10.5 million. Cop killer Chris Garnier getting vet veterans benefits. And now Terry Lynn McClintock upgraded to a healing lodge. How come the only people doing better under this Liberal government seem to be murderers? Yeah. <laughs> Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, as I already mentioned, the Minister of Public Safety has asked the Corrections Commissioner to do a review and to make sure that the current policies and procedures were indeed followed and to determine whether those policies and procedures are still appropriate. Mr. Speaker, we will await the findings of the Commissioner. Thank you. The Honourable Deputy de Louis Saint Laurent. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to talk here about plain common sense. <clears throat> plain common sense. Canadians want to see convicted killers behind bars. Now, this is something that outrages all Canadians. Here's a woman who was transferred to a healing lodge. No common sense there. She has her own bedroom, bathroom, kitchen, and living room. There is no plain good sense there. Now, when the minister can reverse the decision, when will he do so? The decision to change the security classification of this particular inmate was made in 2014 under the previous government. That inmate is, was determined to be medium security, and she remains in a medium security institution. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member, Mr. Speaker, the power to do this exists, to change the unacceptable. Now, at one point, a Liberal Minister did this. There was a killer convicted of killing a police officer who was put in one kind of prison, but they put an end to it, and he is now Minister of Agriculture. Can the uh, Minister of Public Safety not be inspired by what the Minister of did in 2011? Speaker, regarding that transfer of an inmate in 2001 and the subsequent decision to transfer the inmate to another institution, the then Solicitor General told this chamber, quote, the decision was made by Correction Service Canada after evaluation to transfer him to another institution. End quote. As Stephen Harper's former Minister of Public Safety said, I do not control the security classification of individual prisoners. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Deputy. The Honourable Member for Berry Chambly. Mr. Speaker, we know that CSIS has been spying on environmental groups simply because they're opposed to the oil industry shenanigans. Organizations pressing for better environmental protection are considered 
as a risk to national security. This also happened under the Conservatives. How can the government justify having spied on Canadian citizens and how can wanting to save the environment threaten national security? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Government vigorously defends the rights of all Canadians to peaceful assembly and demonstration. In 2017, the Security Intelligence Review Committee investigated and dismissed the complaint at hand in this matter, finding that CSIS had not acted outside of its mandate and that its activities were reasonable and necessary. As the Federal Court is reviewing this decision, we cannot comment further at this time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member that are being referenced, this government is trying to keep those shared behind closed-door deliberations. Non seulement c'est troublant que le CRS... Not only is it disturbing that CSIS has spied on these people, but they have shared information with the National Energy Board and even some oil companies. And the government is trying to hide all this and keep it behind closed doors. They talk about transparency when they came to power, what does the government have to hide? Why does this have to happen in secret? Mr. Speaker, we've introduced national security legislation that will clarify once and for all that advocacy, protest, dissent, and artistic expression are not activities that undermine the security of Canada. They are, in fact, hallmarks of a free and democratic society. Unlike the Harper Conservatives who labelled protesters as foreign-funded radicals, we recognise that not everyone will agree with all of our decisions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Mr. Speaker, yesterday, Prime Minister claimed he believes in the rights of all Canadians to peacefully protest, and yet proceedings before the federal court this week suggest the contrary. It's been revealed that CSIS is treating environmental activists as a threat to national security and sharing this information with the National Energy Board and private corporations. Liberals promised to undo Harper's repressive Bill C-51. How then can this government accuse Canadians exercising their democratic rights as a risk to national security? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, we are undoing Harper's C-51. We have a piece of legislation that will be before this House, C-59, that will make improvements that people have been demanding. We have had the most widespread consultation on this piece of legislation, and we are confident that it will reflect the needs and the desires of the people of Canada. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Mr. Speaker, this is personal, not just for me, but for all Canadians who speak up for protection of their community's health and environment. In the 1980s, Canadians were called un-Albertan for protesting a dam. A utilities board was later shut down when it was discovered that the utilities board was spying on farmers who were protesting a power line. I call on this government to rein in CSIS now before Canadians' democratic rights to protest are further eroded. Here, here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I just want to reinforce what I've said earlier. We have introduced national security legislation which will clarify once and for all that advocacy, protest, dissent and artistic impressions are not activities that undermine the security of Canada. Mr. Speaker, C-59 was developed with the most extensive consultation we have ever done. It will reflect the needs and desires of the Canadian people. Thank you. Honourable Member for Sarnia Lambton. Mr. Speaker, the national pharmacare consultation that's online um, that the Liberals are doing doesn't even mention rare diseases. One in 12 Canadians has a rare disorder. Why is the Health Minister systematically discriminating against this group, and will she update her consultation to ensure that input on rare diseases is included? 
Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to improving access to necessary prescription medications, including orphan drugs, as we understand the difficulties experienced by people dealing with rare medical conditions. To that end, we've launched a regulatory review of Drugs and Devices Initiative, a major effort to improve the availability of prescription medications, including drugs for rare diseases. Last year, our government alone authorized 36 new drugs, and we look forward to the Health Committee's report on rare diseases. The member for Sarnia Lampton. Well, you know, first it was discrimination against people with type 2 diabetes, and then autism, and then multiple sclerosis, and now this. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Rare Disease Organization testified that government, uh, the Liberal government has not kept any of their promises on access to drugs for rare diseases. Now they're being excluded from the pharmacare discussions. Why are the Liberals discriminating against people with rare diseases? The Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to improving access to necessary prescription medications, including orphan drugs, as we understand the difficulties experienced by people dealing with rare diseases. We're working on improving accesses to orphan drugs, and we have, as I said earlier, launched a regulatory review of Drugs and Devices Initiative, and we encourage people with rare diseases and CORD to work with the uh, implementation of National Pharmacare Council to give advice to the development of that, uh, those recommendations. Honourable Member for Kamloops, Thompson Caribou. Mr. Speaker, healing lodges are for criminals who are getting ready to transition back into society. It's job training, it's language, it's culture, and it's household maintenance. Healing lodges are not appropriate for Tory Stafford's murderer, who is not eligible for parole until 2031. Her crimes are heinous and she belongs behind bars. Why can the Liberals not see this? Why can they not act? They're hiding behind a lot of excuses and they just need to actually do something appropriate and take action. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, the Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, I will repeat again. Section 28 of the Corrections Act says that inmate placement decisions must be made by correctional services. That act was created in 1992 by a Conservative government, and Parliament decided that that power did not belong to a minister. Section 28 was last updated by the Harper government. As much as he might like to, the Minister of Public Safety cannot simply overrule laws created. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Kamloops, Thompson Caribou. In spite of all the money they spent on deliverology, they clearly didn't learn any lessons. We have something here that is absolutely absurd. We have someone that is a murderer who is in a facility where children play. It's been less than nine years since she committed her offence. So instead of hiding around excuses, other ministers have taken action in other governments. It's time for this government to act. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. All Canadians share the grief and the pain and the family of little Tory Stafford. That being true, Mr. Speaker, the Minister has asked the Commissioner of the Correctional Service of Canada to review this case and ensure that all the policies and procedures that are in place were appropriate applied, and he has also asked her to review to make sure that these policies and procedures remain appropriate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Beauport, Côte de Beaupré, Ile d'Orléans, Charlevoix. Mr. Speaker, the Canadian Victims Bill of Rights has supra-constitutional status and includes the principle of a right to information for victims and their families. It is unacceptable that the parents of Tory Stafford were informed after the transfer when they should have been before the transfer. This terrible fiasco only adds to the family's pain and trauma. Will the Prime Minister shoulder his responsibility and cancel the transfer of this criminal, yes or no? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's important that we understand what the requirements are, what the policies are, what the legal actions available to all members, ministers and members of government. Now, Section 28 makes it quite clear that the authority to correct, to make a different placement decision, rests with the correction services. 
That power does not belong to a minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Perth Wellington. Mr. Speaker, Terry Lynn McClintock pled guilty to the first degree murder of eight year old Victoria Stafford of Woodstock. She was eight years old. Now, McClintock is being transferred from a prison with bars and razor wire to a healing lodge. A healing lodge where the Commissioner of Corrections has confirmed <coughs> there are children present. Every Liberal on that side knows this is wrong. Will the Prime Minister reverse this decision? Honourable Prime Minister Secretary. Mr. Speaker, the Minister has asked the Commissioner of the Correctional Service of Canada to review this case to ensure that all decision making was properly done in accordance with the law and long standing policies that stretch back more than a decade. To correct the public record, I want to confirm that CSC's a correctional facility has both minimum and medium security capacity. This particular offender was classified as medium security back in 2014. Thank you. Honourable Member for ABTB, Mr. Speaker, whenever I'm in my riding, entrepreneurs talk to me about the contortions they have to perform to avoid closing stop because of a lack of manpower, despite cutting our business hours, wage hikes, trying to recruit abroad, they see no light at the end of the, t of the uh, tunnel. They will see their investments wiped out. What are the Liberals going to do about this? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. The fact remains that Canada and our government is firmly focused on investing in small businesses and ensuring we create a competitive economy for entrepreneurs to grow. What we've done is we've lowered taxes, we've lowered small business taxes, we've lowered taxes on the middle class. The Minister of Finance pointed out yesterday that we've had 8% growth the last six consecutive quarters of business investment. Our government is making investments to ensure that Canadian businesses thrive. Honourable Member for <laughs> Tibbins James Bay. Speaker, the Liberals fought the Human Rights Tribunal over four non-compliance orders, ignored an order of Parliament to flow funds to the underfunded child welfare, and the price of that delay was the death of 12 children in the broken foster care system in Ontario. I encourage this government to read that report. It's a damning indictment of children being disappeared into a gulag of hopelessness. And the report shows that Indigenous children are still suffering systemic negligence in areas of underfunded education, lack of mental health services, even protection from abuse. Doesn't this government understand that the primary responsibility of a nation is to protect its children? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, the Minister of Indigenous The overrepresentation of Indigenous children in the child welfare, welfare system is a humanitarian crisis. Our government is reforming the current broken system that takes far too many Indigenous children to their care. We are providing funding to First Nations child and family services agencies based on actual needs with an emphasis on prevention. We are working with our partners to transform the delivery of Indigenous child welfare so that community, it is community directed and focused on prevention. Bravo. Honourable Member for Calgary, Mindapur. Mr. Speaker, a person who is convicted of murdering a child deserves to be behind bars. Right. A judge sentenced Terry Lynn McClintock to be behind bars until 2031 for the brutal murder of eight-year-old Tori Stafford. Instead, she's being held at a lodge that doesn't even have a fence. Will the Prime Minister use the power he has to correct this wrong? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our hearts do go out to the family of Tory Stafford for the loss that they endured. And the Minister of Public Safety has requested that the Commissioner of Corrections do a review of that placement, make sure that all policies and procedures were followed, and to ensure that the policies and procedures in place are indeed appropriate. The offender is currently housed in a correctional institution equipped to provide programming in a medium security environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Calgary, Mindapur. 
We ended pizza parties for criminals, and they can't even e keep a child killer behind bars. Mr. Speaker, the prison system reports to the Minister of Public Safety. Terry Lynn McClintock needs to be behind bars and not surrounded by razor wire, not surrounded by trees and children. The minister has the power to reverse this decision. When will he? Yeah. Yeah. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker. As media reports today confirm, the decision on which institution to place an inmate cannot be made by the Minister of Public Safety. It must be made by Correction Services Canada. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Order. The Honourable Member for uh, Calgar uh, Calgary Heritage. Mr. Speaker, this summer the Prime Minister failed to get construction started on the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. Failed. He could use legislation to deliver this pipeline, but instead he's content to claim helplessness in the face of the forces lined up against it and to allow the project to sit idle. Since the Prime Minister has no plan, will he commit today to adopting the step-by-step -step path presented by the leader of the Can Canada's Conservatives and finally get this project built? Yeah. Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, we are and will continue to work hard to make sure that the projects such as Trans Mountain Pipeline Expansion move forward in the right way. What the Honourable Member is proposing is the failed policies of the Harper government that did not get a single pipeline built to, expose, uh, to expand our global non-US markets. We are going to do things differently. We are going to engage with Indigenous peoples to make sure we are respecting the right to be constitutionally consulted in a meaningful way, and we're going to take action on the environment. Bravo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Right, Honourable Member for Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Brock. Mr. Speaker, Alberta Oil and Gas supports more than 1,000 Ontario businesses. More than 69,000 Ontarians have Alberta Oil and Gas to thank for their jobs. Ontario construction companies, manufacturing, technology firms, hospitals and schools all benefit from Alberta Oil and Gas. A healthy domestic energy sector is estimated to provide $50 billion in revenue to Ontario over the next 20 years. Ontario wants a plan to build this pipeline. When will this government stop the delays and build the Trans Mountain Pipeline? Here, here. Honourable Minister of Natural Reserves. Mr. Speaker, we know that uh, Canada's energy sector has been a source of well-paying middle-class jobs and it will remain a source of well-paying middle-class jobs for decades to come. <coughs> that is why we're working really hard to expand our global non-US market so we can get better price for our natural resources, so we can create thousands of thousands of jobs that are lacking because of the failed policies of the Harper government that failed to build a single pipeline to non-US markets. We will do it in the right way, Mr. Speaker. Member for Courtney Alberni. Mr. Speaker, Sean Bruyer is a decorated veteran and a strong advocate for veterans in Canada. For their contributions and sacrifices, all veterans and their families deserve to be supported and treated with respect by their government. Yet when Mr. Bruyer, Bruyer presented estimates to this government, the minister attacked his character and called it a mistruth. The minister's own staff told him that Mr. Bruyer's comments were accurate and his estimates were confirmed by department documents. My question is simple, Mr. Speaker. Will the minister stand in this house right now and apologize to Mr. Bruyer. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Veterans Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We assure that, that uh, veterans and their families know what programs are available to them. That's why it's so important to explain what the life pension includes, and that's why our minister held more than 42 co public consultations in order to get the message out on the lifetime pension. I can tell you that the results are excellent to Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Abitibi, to Ms. Kamang. Mr. Speaker, as the Prime Minister acknowledged himself, it's unacceptable for women veterans, especially francophones, not to are not receiving the same level of services as men. 
if we launch major campaigns to encourage women to join the army, if we ask women veterans to talk about subjects as difficult as assault and or harassment rather that they may have been subjected to in the forces, does the government not understand that immediate action must be ta must take place to ensure that services are provided in both official languages? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague for raising the subject. Gender equality is very important for us. And whether it's 10 or 10,000 requests, all veterans are eligible to for receiving the same uh, provisions, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. North Burlington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our economy is booming, and a key factor in this economic strength is our immigration program. Our government understands that a strong and smart immigration system supports our economy, creates Canadian jobs, and fills labour market needs. In my riding of Oakville, North Burlington, we see workers and entrepreneurs like Ancilla Ho Young, who have immigrated to our country, making positive contributions to our society. Can the minister expand on why immigration matters to Canada's economy? Good question. Yeah, well, minister of Immigration. Merci à la I'd like to thank uh, the member for her question. I travel from Halifax to uh, Coquitlam and from Drum Drummondville, Quebec to uh, Whitehorse, Yukon. Uh, with an aging population and labor shortages that I was able to witness uh, all across our country, we've, res we've responded as a government by introducing an immigration program, a responsible program that will ensure measured growth and a responsible rate of growth. Our programs are simply attracting the best and the brightest talent from around the world. As a government, we'll continue to ensure that we create good middle-class jobs for Canadians and a good economy. The Honourable Member for Yorkton, Melville. Mr. Speaker, for outraged veterans and the victim's family, there's been no explanation by the Minister of Veterans Affairs that in any way justifies providing Christopher Garnier with veterans funding to treat PTSD that resulted from his brutal, deliberate killing of Officer Catherine Campbell. Catherine's family is looking for this part of their nightmare to end, and the only way for that to happen is to stop paying veterans benefits to Christopher Garnier. On behalf of the victim's family, will this minister do the right thing? Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Our hearts go out to the family of Constable Campbell. We review the finding and direct the department to ensure the service received by a family members of veterans are related to the veteran service, and when they are not, that the case be reviewed by a senior official. Address its policy, its relations to providing treatment to family members under extenuating circumstances such as convictions of a serious crime. This will ensure we continue to support veterans and their family who needs help. The Honourable Member for Surus Moose Mountain. Mr. Speaker, I have a constituent who has been waiting for over a year for his disability claims to be processed by Veteran Affairs. Dylan, a veteran, honourably and faithfully served our country. Yet Christopher Garnier, a convicted murderer who never served a day in his life, continues to get his private PTSD therapy covered by Veteran Affairs. PTSD that was caused by murdering Constable Catherine Campbell. When will the minister stop disrespecting Canadian veterans and end this murderer's taxpayer-funded treatment? Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, let's talk about respect. We understand what families live each time the Conservatives bring something back on the floor. Imagine what they go through. Imagine being reminded of each case for reasons of confidentiality. My colleague opposite knows that we cannot directly comment on a specific case. We will always be there for our veterans with respect. Hello. Order. The Honourable Member for Chikudmi Le Fior. Mr. Speaker, it took a very long time for the Minister of Veterans Affairs to issue a directive stating that a civilian could no longer receive benefits earmarked for veterans and their families while in prison. If it hadn't been for the Conservatives forcing the Minister to take a stand, nothing would have been done. So now what's happening with the benefits received Mr. Christopher Garnier is receiving? When will the Minister take charge, show leadership and cancel those benefits? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. 
Mr. Speaker, our hearts go out to, to the Campbell family. Once again, Mr. Speaker, allow me to take this opportunity to say that this petty politics lacks sensitivity. It's a lack of compassion for the families. We have responded to the request, contrary to the Harper Conservatives. We understand that when a veteran serves, a family serves, and we will always defend veterans, Mr. Speaker. Member for Durham. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Veterans Affairs refuses to apologize to a veteran that he personally attacked. The Minister's own department confirms that Sean Bruyere is right about the Liberal broken promise on pensions. The War Amps has confirmed that there's a Liberal broken promise on veterans. And today we learn that the Library of Parliament has confirmed that Mr. Bruyere's assessment is correct. We don't care about how many meetings the minister has had because he's been misleading veterans. Will he stand today in this House and apologize to Sean Bruyere for the personal attack? Mr. Speaker, once again, our hearts go out to the Campbell family. We know, and my colleague opposite knows, that for reasons of confidentiality, we cannot speak to the specific case. But all I'm asking for all I'm asking for from our colleagues opposite is to think for a few moments about compassion, to think about what the families must be going through, through on a daily basis by bringing up such a sensitive matter, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to see them show a little compassion for our veterans, Mr. Speaker. I've heard a lot. I remember for Barry Innisfil, and he hasn't had the floor, I'd ask him to restrain himself and not to interrupt and to wait till it's his turn, which will come eventually, I'm sure. The honourable member for Kootenay, Columbia. The Narwhal investigation recently revealed the Liberals have broken their promise to stop muzzling Canada's scientists. The Parks Canada biologist said he was, and I quote, painfully aware of the agency's restrictive treatment of the media. Reporters are finding that their interviews with employees are highly scripted and can take a lot of time to organize. Canadians need to know that scientists can, as the Minister has said, speak freely about their work to the media and to the public. How can this government claim high ground while following conservative footsteps? When will the muzzling end? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let's be very clear that we believe our scientists should be out there. They should be talking about the science, um, and we need to hear their voices. I've always been clear about that with my portfolio with Parks Canada, the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency, and in Environment and Climate Change Canada. I, I will continue to say that scientists should speak out about science. We need to make decisions based on science, and that's what our government believes and are acting on. The Honourable Member for Longueuil Saint Hubert. Mr. Speaker, yesterday, 42 of our creators and artisans of our culture signed an open letter calling on the government to defend the cultural exemption in NAFTA and to ensure that it applies to online platforms so that we can demand that these platforms contribute to our culture. That means that the Netflix agreement, where no taxes are being required, no contribution, and no production in French, are not acceptable. Will the Liberals guarantee that Quebec and all governments across the country will keep their right to take action on culture? We're not going to get rid of our our culture as if it were like spare change in NAFTA, are we? Speaker, our government has been clear. The cultural exemption must stand within a renegotiated NAFTA. The Prime Minister has stated it and I'm repeating it today. Protecting our creative industry means protecting our culture. It means protecting a $53.8 billion industry representing over 650,000 quality jobs for middle class Canadians. We'll defend our cultural sovereignty and the cultural sector within a future deal because it's the right thing to do for Canada. The Honourable Member for Portneuf Charcartier. Mr. Speaker, the government is holding Canadian companies hostage and making consumers pick up the tab. This is putting them in a position of weakness when it comes to NAFTA. Now, there's a company in my writing that owns facilities in the States and has to pay a 10% surtax to pr export product back to its own company, and consumers are picking up the tab. Why is this government not respecting Canadian companies? Why are taxpayers have 
attempting to pick up the tab for the government's amateur approach. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, we understand that these illegal measures have created serious challenges for Canadian businesses and workers. But as you know, that is why we have made available $2 billion to defend the interests of workers and companies in Canada. That includes an extension for work sharing programs, funding for training, funds to enhance competitiveness, and corporate support for them to diversify their exports. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. For Central Okanagan, Similkameen Nicola. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals are targeting Canadian small businesses yet again. And for what reason? For being small. They're refusing to allow firms with under 200 employees to apply for tariff relief. Yep. This means small businesses are being forced to either eat those costs or raise their prices on Canadian consumers. Now, the Liberal plan on tariffs is to redirect that money, Mr. Speaker, to the large firms with the high-priced lobbyists. Why are Liberals ignoring small business owners who are hardest hit by these tariffs? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, as the son of someone who owned an SME, I understand the impact of government action on the economy for our companies. And that is why we have launched innovative programming and solutions which are designed to support research and uh, startup development. Mr. Speaker, for the Conservatives, supporting small business meant putting more money into the pockets of millionaires who don't need it. We believe that tax cuts uh, will benefit companies, small and medium-sized companies, because they... It's over, it's over. It's your time, you're done. Right, the Honourable Member for Oshawa. Mr. Speaker. Millions of jobs depend on the survival of NAFTA, and Oshawa's auto sector is worried that no deal will result in catastrophic job losses. Last year, RBC Economics reported that 500,000 jobs alone are vulnerable if NAFTA fails, and the Canadian Automotive Dealers Association has suggested an additional 100,000 jobs could be lost in Ontario if the U.S. imposes auto tariffs on Canada. Mr. Speaker, will the Prime Minister confirm that Canada will be exempt from auto tariffs should no deal be reached by this week? Mr. Speaker, let's talk about some economic facts. Here's one in July. Canada's exported a record high of more than $51 billion supporting millions of middle-class jobs. We had the highest GDP growth in the G7 in the last year, and we've created over half a million jobs since coming into power. We're working to build on those record exports by getting the right deal for NAFTA, and we're committed to defending our national interest. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Egmont. Order. Mr. Speaker, this government has made strong science-based decision-making one of its priorities. This was first demonstrated to Canadians when the government re-established the position of Chief Science Advisor to Canada, mm -hmm. which the Harper Conservatives got rid of. What else has our government been doing to ensure that science-based decision-making continues question. to be a priority? Honourable Parliament, the Secretary to the Minister of Fisheries. Order. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank that uh, upstanding member of Parliament from Prince Edward Island for that excellent question. Uh, some of the many highlights of Budget 2018 include $210 million for the Canada Research Chairs Program, $1.2 million for granting councils, but, Mr. Speaker, there's more. Recently, our Ministers of Fisheries and Oceans and Environment and Climate Change announced the establishment of new departmental science advisor positions. These science advisors will play an important role in supporting quality scientific research within the federal departments that will help ensure government science is fully available to the public. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Peace River West Law. Mr. Speaker, last spring I went to Washington and I stood with victims of sex trafficking as they celebrated the major passing of FOSTA-SESTA in Congress, removing the existing immunity for companies who, know, who knowingly profit off sex trafficking. Now tech companies are lobbying the U.S. government to bring back sex trafficking immunity provisions to NAFTA and with the negotiations in Canada. Can the government confirm that the Canada-U.S. trade deal will not import the ability for companies to legally profit from sex trafficking? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Honorable Parliamentary Secretary. House that this government takes the issue of sex trafficking and trafficking in general with the utmost seriousness. We will always address this issue with the utmost concern. We will take the members' comments into consideration with respect to our negotiations, both with what we are doing domestically and with what we are doing internationally. There is a report coming through from the Standing Committee on Justice on human trafficking, including sex trafficking, and we wait eagerly the results of that committee's recommendations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. No, I don't think so. Ink, ink, sit down. Not going to. Okay. In Canada, we are fortunate that. In Canada, we are fortunate that a person's socioeconomic background does not automatically limit the opportunities that are available to them, especially when it comes to education. In fact, Canada leads both the OECD and the G7 when it comes to children being able to complete post-secondary education in families where their own parents did not. This means that more young people are able to get the skills they'll need to succeed in a changing economy. What is the government doing to make sure that there are good economic opportunities for these young Canadians when they graduate? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Finance. I thank the Honourable Member from Northumberland, Peter Rosselves, for this very important question. Canada has made great progress, but there is more work to be done. Young Canadians still feel that they don't have the same economic opportunities afforded to their parents. They are hardworking, talented, ambitious, and have the right skills, but there are still challenges to addressing the changing labour market. In my new role as PS to Finance, I'm focused on youth economic opportunities, and I look forward to working with Canadian, young Canadians across this country to make sure they are a part of our thriving economy. For Calgary, Rocky Ridge. Mr. Speaker, Mohamed Borna has been waiting since 2006 to find out if he can stay in Canada. His application is completed for over 10 years. The Department of Citizenship and Immigration has failed to give him an answer, including this past summer when another promised decision date came and went. I've repeatedly brought this to the attention of Minister McCallum and to the current minister. So will the minister today commit to a date by which a decision on Mr. Borna will be made? His family need to know. Wow. Honourable Minister of Immigration. Mr. Speaker, uh, the Honourable Member knows that uh, although I'm aware of this case, I cannot go into the private details of a particular case due to privacy laws. Uh, my door is always open to engage members of Parliament as they advocate on behalf of their constituents, and I invite the Honourable Member uh, to uh, approach me at any uh, moment to discuss this case. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Joliette. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Wall Street Journal is confirming that Donald Trump will today notify Congress of the failure of the NAFTA agreements. It's clear he's always wanted negotiations to fail so that he can loudly and clearly announce that he stands up for America first at his partisan rallies. Regardless of what the government concedes or would have conceded, there will be no agreement. And the government will be in a weak position for the real negotiations after the midterm elections. Can the government announce, tell us that it won't give up anything during Donald Trump's fake, fake, fake negotiations, or will they be weakening our ag agriculture for nothing? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, we have always been clear that. We defend the principles that, that a good we must have a good agreement. Canada has stated that we will defend what we will defend, and that is what we have done, and it's what we will continue to do. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Joliet. Honorable Member for Joliet. But, Mr. Speaker, for months now, the government has been telling us that it's prepared for any outcome at the NAFTA negotiations. For months, it's been telling us that it has a plan to protect the interests of people, regardless of whether the negotiations lead to an agreement or fail. But we've still not even seen a glimpse of that plan. Quebec workers, Quebec companies are all worried. Now that we see Donald Trump wants a crisis instead of an agreement, could the government tell us what its famous plan is all about? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. I thank the Honourable Member for the question, and I can give some figures uh, to the member. In a, We hit to record levels of uh, exports, uh, this affected Quebec. We are focusing on our accomplishments. We want to achieve a good NAFTA agreement for Canadians. Of course, we are going to be defending our national interests, and we will 
only sign a good agreement for Canada, not just any agreement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Repentigny. After being rebuffed by the courts, the government is now forced to reassess the Trans Mountain Pipeline project. But the government will be both judge and jury and in, is in a position of conflict of interest. The government bought the pipeline. The government's promising in the House that the project will go ahead and be built. The government's limiting the reassessment to 22 weeks. And meanwhile, the CEO of Trans Mountain has stated publicly that uh, groundwork will start next summer. How are we supposed to believe the conclusions of this, that the conclusions of this study haven't already been written ahead of time? Of natural resources. Mr. Speaker, we have a clear plan and we have instructed the uh, National Energy Board to reconsider its recommendations, taking into account the efforts of project, uh, effect of the project-related green shipping on this. Second, we will be presented to NEB all the work that has been done by the government on protecting uh, the ocean as well as the coastal communities, and we're going to move forward on this project with proper consultation and a meaningful dialogue with indigenous Canadians uh, and communities uh, so that we can move forward in the right way. The Honourable Member for Regina Louvain. Mr. Speaker, yesterday Statistics Canada reported that average weekly earnings dropped by 0.4% nationally and by a full percentage point in Saskatchewan, which is now tied for the slowest earnings growth among provinces. Governments can help to boost employee earnings by enforcing fair minimum wages. Unfortunately, Canada still does not have a federal minimum wage. When will this government enact a federal minimum wage of at least $15 per hour? Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Colleague for his question. The fact remains that we continue to reduce taxes for the middle class. In addition to that, uh, we've seen the lowest unemployment rate in nearly 40 years, and as a result of our investments, Canadians will be approximately two, a typical Canadian family will be approximately $2,000 better off than under the previous Conservative government. Our investments are working, our economy is growing, we have one of the best balance sheets in the G7, and these are commitments that are going to benefit all Canadians across this country. This will conclude question period for today. The Honourable Member. I would like to remind my Liberal colleagues on the other side that I will never again accept as being described as we are lacking compassion because we defend the victims of crime. I will never accept what they are saying about us. I'm sorry, that is not a point of order but a point of debate. Tabling of documents. Secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Monsieur, Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, in accordance to Section 32.2 of the Standing Orders, I have the honour of tabling in both official languages the 2017-2018 National Action Plan on the UN Security Council's Resolution on Women, Peace and Security. Introduction of Government Bills Statements by Ministers Reports from Interparliamentary Delegations Presenting Reports from Committees Members' Bills First Reading of Senate Public Bills Motions Presenting Petitions The Honourable Member for Sturgeon River Parkland Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to present a, a petition on behalf of my constituents and Canadians who oppose this Liberal government's ideological and discriminatory summer jobs program attestation. This petition, signed by over 500 Canadians, calls upon the government to respect the deeply held beliefs of millions of Canadians. Any government program that requires an attestation of belief violates the Charter of Rights, chiefly Section 2A and 2B, which guarantee freedom of conscience, religion, and freedom of belief. I call on this government to repeal this hateful attestation. 
I remind honorable yeah. colleagues that, uh, that to present pitches isn't the time to take part in debate and express their personal opinions on matters, but to simply present what the, what the petitioners are, uh, are saying, of course. Honorable Deputy de Belleuil Chambly. The Honorable Member for Belleuil Chambly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have the honor of presenting a petition which started with the work of David Morin from my riding and other citizens who attended several summer events asking for the government to stop the purchase of the Trans Mountain Pipeline and to block its expansion. I'm proud of my citizens and proud to present their efforts in the hope that the government is listening. Alberni. Mr. Speaker, it's an honour to table a petition on behalf of uh, residents from Tofino, British Columbia, calling on the government to create a national strategy to combat plastics from entering our waterways. They're looking at regulations aimed at reducing plastic debris discharge from stormwater outfalls, industrial use of microplastics, including microbeads, uh, nurdles, fibrous microplastics and fragments, consumer and industrial use of industrial plastics, including polystyrene, which is filling up our ocean, Mr. Speaker, cigarette filters and beverage containers, and they want permanent, dedicated and annual funding for the cleanup of derelict fishing gear and community-led cleanup uh, projects to you know, protect our, our shores, our banks, and our beaches and aquatic per peripheries. Uh, the Honourable Member for Hallibur Halliburton, Quarter Lakes, Brock. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I do appreciate the opportunity to rise and present this petition on behalf of constituents from across Ontario. The petitioners here, Speaker, are calling on the Prime Minister to defend the freedoms of conscience, thought, and belief and withdraw the attestation requirement for applicants to the Canada Summer Jobs Program. Thank you, Speaker. Member for Yorkton Melville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm presenting a petition this morning on behalf of cottage owners and homeowners whose cottages and homes are located at Crooked Lake, Saskatchewan, on land leased from the Government of Canada. And those concerned uh, wish to draw attention to the 650 to 700 percent lease increase being imposed on Crooked Lake leaseholders for the year 2015 to 19. Being that this increase has imposed without jointly agreed to negotiations between the Government of Canada and or its appointed authority and the leaseholders and their representatives, and with the threat of lease cancellation being imposed, the undersigned con call upon Minister Bennett and the Government of Canada to negotiate a fair lease agreement with the cottage owners who lease land from the Government of Canada. Thank you. Presenting petitions, Présentation de Pétition, for a question on the order paper, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Government House Leader. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, I would ask that all questions be allowed to stand at this time, please. Is it agreed? Agreed and so ordered. Orders of the day. Orders of the day, Government Orders, Government Bills Commons, resuming debate at second reading of Bill C-82, Multilateral Instrument in Respect of Tax Conventions Act. Reprise de débat. Resuming debate. The Honourable Member for Belleuil Chambly. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I would like to thank my nearly neighbour uh, from uh, Champlain. Today we are just debating Bill C-82, which does not necessarily have the most exciting title in the world, but which touches a very important issue. We would implement a multilateral convention which ha relates to the um, transfer of tax monies out of the country and the shrinking of the tax base. I think it's very important to discuss this issue. Tax avoidance is and tax evasion are serious issues and we must act immediately. It is becoming a bigger and bigger problem, not only for us as legislators, but also for our citizens. Mr. Speaker, this issue might not resonate with ordinary Canadians when we go door to door in our ridings, when we speak with our constituents at various events. You might think that the Income Tax Act and tax conventions, all of this might seem to be very far from day to day life from the daily lives of our constituents who are busy sending their kids to school, looking after their health, and managing their own household budgets. However, 
when you realize just how unfair the current tax situation is and when you consider that ordinary Canadians pay their taxes and yet the Canada Revenue Agency will go after them um, with unbridled enthusiasm. Um, we, we all know someone who's separated and who is much worse off afterwards and who are targeted, as it seems, by Revenue Canada. If you ever had the opportunity to read the letters that the CRA would send to an ordinary citizen, well, it's very difficult to understand, even for people like us, for members of parliament, we might have trouble understanding the, the correspondence sent by Revenue Canada. Um, you almost have to hire an accountant or a lawyer to read the correspondence of the Canada Revenue Agency, which claims to be a good manager of the money or tax revenues of Canadians. The current situation is deplorable, and it's made even worse by the fact that some of the best off people in our society, business leaders or friends of those in power, are taking advantage of exemptions and badly written legislation and agreements which do not go far enough. So these wealthy individuals are better off under all of these instruments than, for instance, a single mother. These wealthy people can uh, travel and holiday in the Barbados, leave their money there, and that's unacceptable. It's unacceptable for a society like ours because the social contract we have and the collective wealth we share requires that tax monies are redistributed fairly. And this is one of the most fundamental traits of our society. So, when you realize that some people do not want to respect this social contract, this commitment to um, the better good, well, when the government doesn't fix that situation, it means it has failed. And these failures will do nothing but grow the divide between the very wealthy and everyone else, including those who are less well off. It's funny because the Prime Minister loves to talk about the middle class and those working hard to join it. But the reality is that when I'm in my riding, I don't have in my head the middle class and those working hard to join it. I see ordinary Canadians who are doing the best they can and who feel that elected representatives are doing nothing to help them in their daily lives. Now, clearly, there are Canadians who are relatively way, well off. The Prime Minister likes to call them cheaters, um, including small and medium-sized business owners who sure may do better than many others, but they've deserved what they have. They worked very hard as entrepreneurs to earn what they have. But there are a lot of people in my writing, for instance, who are working so hard and still struggling to put food on the table and pay their rent. And they just don't have the same means many other people have. But all of these people have one thing in common, and this is what motivates me as a member of parliament. All of these people, and I'm thinking of uh, the expression, the rising tide which raises all ships. In other words, we live in a society where wealth should help everybody. However, what we're seeing is that the 1% sometimes it's literally 1% of all citizens. And these people might include friends of the finance minister, friends of the prime minister, donors to the Liberal Party. All these people um, have benefits which um, have as a result the fact that it's, the system is not working anymore. Our critic on um, tax matters works very hard and does an excellent job. And 
it's important to note that the youngest ever elected member of parliament, the member of Sherbrooke, who has not only been re-elected through hard work, this is an MP who knows his or her files well, including the file on tax matters. There is also the member for New Burnaby Westminster, who's the NDP finance critic, who also does excellent work. It is our job, Mr. Speaker. We tabled this motion in the House, and our colleague from Joliet has also tabled a motion calling on the government to do more to address the problems in the tax system and the litany of issues I listed at the beginning of my speech. Mr. Speaker, the bill before us seeks to implement multilateral instruments and attempts to address the fact that we do have conventions with other countries which are out of date. And when you look at these instruments, bilateral or multilateral ones, when they don't work anymore, it's important to be able to make changes as soon as possible. Countries will sign bilateral agreements. 